The Alpha Podcast with your hosts from LarsonPress.com, Adrian Larson, and from TMNutrition.net, Tony Montgomery. Today we have uh, Tony Montgomery, myself, talking today about uh, various different topics, but specifically uh, looking at some performance nutrition. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about a couple of contests that we both have coming up. Um, myself, I'm about three weeks away from lifting in the cage um, for Animal at the Arnold. Um, pretty excited about that. It's an honor to get asked to go out to the cage and lift. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ruin the surprise of what I'm gonna bench because I really don't know yet. But hopefully, it's gonna be huge, like 315 huge. <laughs> that'll be a that'll be a showstopper with a slingshot. Yeah, three fifteen slingshot reverse bands. Yeah, yeah. From the ceiling. Yep. That'll be good. I think that'll really catch the crowd's eye and really set you apart from the rest of the guys that are actually lifting real weights. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe yeah. grab a dumbbell, curl it a couple times. Yeah, maybe get into the uh, some of the squat battles. You yeah. Just never know. Cage gets kind of wild. Yeah. I wonder like. My goal is going to be to see like how many girls I can get to flash me while I'm in the cage. Yeah, you could get maybe a few sympathy flashes, <laughs> yeah. and then you can also get like, wow, this guy's the strongest one there. Flashes. Yeah. Maybe like the Hungarian shot putters are the only ones that flash me. Yeah. 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 Great. It's better than nothing. You I'm know? super excited. About Everybody it. needs a hand me down here and there. <laughs> yeah. What uh, are you planning on? Is it just like a max single, or are you going to be doing reps? Yeah, I've decided I'm going to go towards. Uh, just a single, just because shoulder has been a little achy over the last few weeks. Um, and then I have a competition coming up on April 16th here in Portland. And I don't, I, like the goal is to get past that. Um, and then I can really focus on getting my shoulder better. So now I'm just trying to put the band aid on it. Um, I don't want to aggravate it, although I did do a ridiculous amount of reps on the incline last night. Uh, I'm just trying to just get by. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good strategy that way, you know, the healthier you can be going into your off-season, yeah. the better off it's going to be. Yeah. For sure. And then you got the comp coming up here, yep. what are you, like eight, ten weeks out? Uh, ten and a half, yeah. Ten and a half weeks out. It's uh, the weekend after yours, so it's April 23rd down in San Diego. It's the RPS US Open. It's uh, quite the letters, but it's going to be it's gonna be a fun meet. It's a big meet, so there's going to be a really, really good amount of uh, competition out there. I think every weight class is pretty stacked, so I'm just going to do my best to kind of, you know, keep up and not not embarrass myself out there, so it'll be great to see some of the guys, like uh, Zaheer will be out there, and Malik, and some of these guys that are just doing things that you just you just can't really believe, you know, yeah. uh, 181 pounds total in 1,900 in sleeves, it's just something that's kind of unheard of, you know, so that'll be fun to be out there in that atmosphere getting to compete, and then I'll also be competing with uh, some friends from CSA. I think there's three of us, four of us going down there to, to lift, so it'll be cool to catch up with those guys and, you know, share the platform with them, and I'm really looking forward to it, so. Now, is this the first time you've, com well, even considered competing at 242? No, I've, I've done both. I've done, it just really depends. Like, if there is a chance to win cash, I'll do a cut. If I'm right now, I'm just focused on being as strong as I can. So for me, that's at a higher weight class without doing much of a cut. Yeah. So I think once I get up to like a level or a number or total that I'm I'm happy with, then I'll focus on where my weight is and stuff like that. So okay. yeah, two forty two is the goal <clears throat> for this meet. But you you never know. Once you start training, once you start dialing your diet, you may start dropping weight, and you know two twenty will be right around the corner. So. It's nice to have that option to pick and choose. You can compete against, uh, is T. Cummins going to be there? No, I don't think so. That'd be, that's kind of surprising he's not because he does like 11 meets a week and yeah. then like 16 mock meets in training. So I would think like that would just fit right into his plan. <laughs> it would. Oh. I think uh, 242 is going to be Dave Ziski, um, John Chivas. Or Rivas, sorry if I'm butchering your name, and and the one-legged monster from uh, Military Muscles. So it'll like be Kendall cool. Marshall, I think. I think so. Yeah. yeah, it'll be cool to share the platform with uh, with another vet, and uh, yeah. you know just get to talk to him a little bit about what he's been through and 
you know, how he's built himself back up and, you know. Are you going to make fun of his leg drive like you make fun of mine? Probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, wanted to make sure that uh, this wasn't like, you weren't discriminating <laughs> just against me. No, I, I discriminate against all disabilities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. Because I'm disabled myself, so it's not, it's not discrimination. It's just, you know, it's funnier that way. Sure. It yeah. It makes you more well-rounded. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm Spanish, so I can make fun of Hispanic people. Sure. You know, it just gives me a lot of leeway to get away with a lot of things. So yeah, so that's the meet. It's uh, eleven weeks out. I'm pretty excited. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds like a like a, a tennis tournament almost, like the U.S. Open. I think that's what they're going for. I think if uh, if enough people get confused, they'll show up thinking that Serena Williams will be there. Sure. But instead, they get to see me in a singlet. That's so, a win win. I think so. Yeah, I think it's good that there's more competitions coming around that are more amped up, like. Uh, more like a pro meet, you know, coming, not, it's not just like a, you know, in the gym, you know, whatever, thrown together in a few weeks or, you know, whatever, but it's actually kind of has the feel to it, like a pro meet, yeah. like done respect, respectfully, and um, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I think um, last year, Jesse Burdick kind of put on those type of meets mm -hmm. and set the bar really high, so a lot of people are just trying to play catch up to him and, and his meets, so... It's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting for powerlifting community in general to have cash prizes at these meets now, and it's gonna raise the level of competition for all the meets to kind of meet that. So it should be a lot of fun for the for the good good powerlifters this year and next year. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, performance nutrition. Uh, it's certainly kind of you're more of the expert. I'm kind of the fat kid that like. I only really dial my stuff in as I get close to a competition. Yeah. And then the rest of the season, it's as much beer and shit food as I can eat and drink. <laughs> um, so I'm not the best example of, like, performance nutrition. Yeah. I did uh, I did cut. I did make a pretty large cut going from about 290 to 220 or 286 to 220. 24-hour um, cut? It was it was basically a 14-minute cut. Yeah. Nice. One, one big sauna set. That was a big dump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I want to kind of get your take on performance nutrition and kind of maybe it would even be helpful for me to hear some ideas of ways to stay, uh, to use nutrition more for my lifting year round versus just maybe a few weeks out. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's not really a topic that gets talked about a lot within the powerlifting realm, you know, especially about a decade ago, it was kind of just get as big as you can and uh, fit yourself into some suits and you know, trying to, the old saying of fitting a 10 pound turd in a two pound bag type of deal, you know, so everybody has that mindset of powerlifting, you can just eat whatever you want, you know, as long as you're within your weight class and, and that'll definitely get you strong, but it may not get you to the highest performance that you want. So some of the things and just a disclaimer before we go over everything is like, there's always going to be outliers, right? So don't ever compare advice to outliers always go into any type of advice with an open an open mind and kind of listen to the commonalities that everyone's given you because if you go into everything and saying like oh this person did it this way this person did it that way and it worked for them you know that's one person out of a huge bell curve so definitely just try to keep an open mind to everything this is just what I've done myself and what I've done with several hundreds of clients and how I've experienced nutrition throughout the decade that I've been doing it. So performance nutrition at its simplest is just um, a breakdown of all three macronutrients, right? Because I feel like any diet that eliminates a macronutrient, say keto, for example, that eliminates carbs is not the best for performance-based athletes, you know? So you got to keep your goals in mind, right? If your goal is to just drop weight and worry about aesthetics, then you're gonna do the diet that allows you to do that the best. But if your goal is to improve performance, which it should be as an athlete, then you need all three macronutrients to do that because all three of them play a vital role in how you perform. You know, you have your protein, which gets broken down to amino acids, which is the building blocks for muscle. You have your fats, which control your hormones. Your hormones are very important for cortisol, you know, for testosterone for things of that nature 
and then you have your carbs, which after every tough workout, you deplete your muscle glycogen, your carbs replenishes it so that you can grow bigger, that you can recover and be ready for your next workout. So if you're doing a diet that is eliminating any of those macronutrients at any point in time, then I wouldn't consider it a performance-based diet. I would just consider it either weight loss or a weight gain diet. You know, So that would be the biggest thing um, that I would look for in a performance-based diet. The main thing, right? everything has a tier to it. right? So the top tier is gonna be calories in versus calories out. If you wanna lose weight, you need to be in a calorie deficit. If you wanna gain weight, you need to be in a calorie expenditure. Meaning, if you're trying to lose weight, and you're eating 2,500 calories a day and you're not losing weight, then you need to drop it down to 2,000 calories a day. You know, So that would be a deficit that you're creating. For performance-based athletes, I always try to put carbohydrates during the workout, before the workout, and after the workout. Right? Those are the three most important meals for recovery, for building muscle, and protein and carbohydrates are extremely important for that. Outside of those three meals, outside of that window, the timing of the carbs and the protein is not as important. You can throw in more fats. You keep your protein pretty much baseline throughout the day, and then you can minimize the carbs. All right, so let's just say you are an athlete that trains at noon. Breakfast can be moderate fats, moderate protein, moderate carbs, pre-workout meal, something that's easy to digest, higher in carbs, lower in fats, intra-workout, something that is a fast digesting carb like waxy maize or um, vitargo or highly burned cyclic dextrins, things like that, low fats, post-workout protein, higher carbs, low fats, and then from there, protein, moderate, fats, moderate, carbs, moderate, right? So that would be the next hierarchy is how you time and plan your meals, right? If your carbohydrates are high, then you want to minimize your fat because carbohydrates spikes your insulin. If your insulin spiking, it's not only going to shuttle the carbs and the glycogen to your muscles, it's also going to shuttle fat if you consume a lot of fat into your fat cells. So if you're trying to uh, get a better body composition to go along with performance, you don't want to mix and match those too much. So that would be the kind of the basis of a performance diet, right? Carbs and protein or carbs, low fats around your workout, higher fats, lower carbs outside of that window. Um, from there, you're going to move into more or less of food quality, right? So you, that's where you get into the fight of like clean foods versus if it fits your macros. Everybody wants to do diets that allows them to eat crap here and there, whether it not be due to the fact that maybe they just don't have the willpower to fully commit. You know, everyone likes to say, I just like to live my life a little, you know, I'll, I'll eat right. and stuff, you know, Cause, right. Cause people get their happiness and their, their, you know, their happiness from food, you know, cause as child, as children, we were rewarded with food, you know, Oh, you got an A on your report card. Here's some candy. Yeah. So now every time we do something good, and the thing that blows me away is like when my clients are like, oh, I lost three pounds this week, you know, I'm going to go celebrate by going to get some ice cream. It's like, <laughs> right. Nine pounds now. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So it kind of defeats the purpose. So food quality is important. It's not as important as the other two things, but to think if that cereal is going to be a better carbohydrate than white rice, you're missing out on... Uh, nutrient dense foods that has other things that is bringing to the table, whereas the cereal is more processed. You know, if you're getting your protein from chicken and steaks as opposed to getting protein from, you know, milk in your cereal, those are two totally different amino acid profiles. They're two totally different set of uh, nutrient dense foods. So you want to shy away from those as much as possible. You know, so those would be the three major hierarchies of performance nutrition is first you balance out your calories in versus your calories out based on your goals, right? If you want to lose weight, you're going to need to be in a 3,500 calorie deficit by the end of the week. So that's 500 calories a day that you're going to be in a deficit to lose one pound a week. 
if you're losing more than one pound a week and you're not a really big person, say like over 280 pounds, you're losing more than one pound a week, then you're losing too much. You're not losing just fat, you're losing muscle, you're losing other stuff that down the road as you get leaner may not really help with performance, right? So after you get those three things intact, then you just ride that out. You know, it's really simple. People tend to overcomplicate it. People tend to overcomplicate it for a few reasons, right? Nutrition is overcomplicated because they're trying to sell you a new product, you know? Oh, try this new fad diet that I'm that I've just invented, you know? Yeah. Or people try to overcomplicate it because there's just so much information out there that they can't really digest what's right and what's wrong, you know? But it's very simple. You keep all three food groups fats, carbs, protein in your diet, you time everything out, right? Higher carb meals, protein, lower fats around the workout, higher fats, lower carbs outside of the workout window. You ride that out and then from there, after about three months of that, you reassess where you're at and then you continue to either go down the path of weight loss or you go down the path of bringing your calories back up. Typically what I see as far as performance goes is people really don't care as much as they say about performance when it comes to dieting. People would rather lose weight and look good and have their performance suffer. Sure. You know, so if that's the case, then just keep dieting because I feel like if you diet for longer than three to four months, you can only be in a calorie deficit for so long without your performance getting hindered. So that's one of the things I wanted to ask you. Um, for me, when I was kind of going through my cut to get down to 220, um, there was like a two week period where I didn't lose any weight. Um, my diet was really on point. Uh, training was at an all time high. I felt like I was losing a little bit of strength because my energy level was a little low. Um, but what do you recommend for somebody who runs into that where maybe they feel like everything's kind of dialed in uh, but they're not seeing the difference that they want to see on the scale. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just typical. That's your genetics, right? Back in the day, the cavemen, you know, they had, they wouldn't eat for days. So what their body would do is their body would try to maintain homeostasis, preserve all the weight that they had so that they wouldn't starve to death. Right. right? So if you deprive your body of calories for so long, there's going to come a point in time where your body is going to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. We're going to starve. So it shuts down your weight loss. So you'll see people, they'll add in more cardio. They'll drop more calories to the point where it's getting extremely low, which could cause metabolic damage if you do it for long enough. What I say is when people hit that plateau and they've been dieting for, say, three months, I would say that's when you start to bump up your calories again, mm -hmm. right? You want to try to raise that ceiling higher and higher so every time you go back to diet in you're dieting at a higher calorie expenditure right so say you did your first diet at 2000 calories you lost 20 pounds after that you start bumping it back up and now you got your calories up to 4000 right mm -hmm. you put back on 10 pounds so you're still in a 10 pound surplus then you're dieting from 4000 calories instead of 2000 right so a lot of people make the mistake of continuing to take something out or adding in more exercise to lose weight when in all reality, you know, just listen to your body, start bringing calories back in. And if you do it right and you time it right, there's, there's a point in time where once you start bringing your calories back in little by little, you can start seeing the weight loss reoccur. Sure. Right. But if, obviously if you're trying to hit a weight class goal, the best thing you could do is add in refeed days if you hit that plateau, right? So say just you carve up like crazy, right? Exactly. So <laughs> let's just say you diet Monday through Saturday. Sunday would be your refeed day, and that would just be you know x amount of carbohydrates throughout the day, keeping the fats low. So say you do twelve hundred carbohydrates throughout the day, split up into seven to eight meals. You know that would be your refeed day to give you enough energy and to kind of trick your body into, you know, saying, okay, we're not starving ourselves anymore. We've got a bunch of food so we can start letting some of the weight go, right. which is why for me, whenever I do my diets for athletes, I like to do carb cycling. Mm -hmm. It'll be a high carb day for um, the highest volume training days. It'll be a medium carb day 
for the other training days, and then it would be a low carb day for the non training days. Right. And the way I like to explain it is the high carb days are for building muscle and for being in a calorie surplus. The medium days are for maintenance. The low days are for fat burning. Right. So every time you hit back to that high day, your body's like, okay, we got a good calorie surplus here. We can start letting go some of the bad weight again, you know, and then you hit your medium and then you hit your low days, you lose a bit of weight. Your body starts to say, oh, we're going to go into starvation mode. Then you hit it again with the high carb day, you know, so. If I was one of your clients, I'd want to do volume every day. <laughs> you say that, but then people, people are like, man, I'm eating too much food. Like yeah. I can't handle all these carbs, but they're still losing weight. Right. You know, so everything needs to be around performance. If you're an athlete, so you got to have days that you're in a calorie expenditure, you know, not every day can be a calorie deficit if you're trying to perform your best in the gym. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I found that was successful for me is, um, you know, I tried quite a few of those fad diets, right? Like, um, you know, get cut out all your carbs completely or, you know, only eat these things or whatever. Um, what I found that worked for me that was like a long-term fix was really what you were talking about is cycling my carbs just around training. Yeah. So as an example, when um, I don't do a ton of volume stuff, but when I have a heavy training day, those are my carb days. Right. Um, and sometimes I'll even carb up the night before, depending on what I have kind of coming up. Um, then the rest of the week, um, on my accessory days, basically it's kind of just moderate carbs, nothing crazy. And then, of course, on my non-training days, I try to keep it as low as I can. Again, this is only really when I'm prepping for a contest. The rest of the time... I don't watch it as much as I should. Yeah. Uh, but as I start, you know, getting into like a six or eight weeks out, I really tighten all that stuff up. I typically will cut weight pretty quickly. Um, as an example, you know, I'm sitting probably at 240 or 241 right now. For the April 16th meet, I'll be at 220 right. fairly easily yeah. just by locking it up. So with these fad diets, do you think that they're successful because – Typically, people are only on them for a week or two, and then they see success because, you know, if you cut out carbs for a week, you're going to lose weight. That's just the right. way it is. Yeah. So, they kind of sell you on, you're going to lose weight, you're on it for a week, your body's obviously goes in shock and is like, you know, what the hell, I needed some carbs, and so people are failing at it. Do you think that's why they're so popular, or? I think once you start, they're, they're popular because they're different, and... They're popular because, like like you said, they, the say the Atkins diet or the uh, keto diet where you take out carbs, you start to lose some of that water weight, right? Because mm -hmm. when you have carbs, carbs are hydrophilic, which means they help you retain water. So for every one gram of carb that you drop, I think it's like four grams of water that your wow. body cuts out too. So if your body is, you know, anywhere from 60% of water, then you're going to start losing weight. Yeah. So initially, you do lose weight, and keto could be effective if you weren't a performance athlete, right? But what I see the downfall is, is that it's not something that you can continue to do because once you cut something out of your diet, you tend to want it the most, mm -hmm. right? So if you cut carbs out, you're going to constantly crave them for the most part, you know, because they're completely out of your diet, Sure. right? So then you have the flip side of a keto type diet with like if it fits your macros that allows you to put in foods here and there, right? Which can be great. They both can be great given your goals. But the problem with the if it fits your macros crowd is that a lot of them will skip meals to save up calories so they can eat worse at night because they have their macros that they can hit. Which what, what that does is it affects your training, right? So say you train that day but you're skipping meals in so you can have more macros at night, then you're going to have a shitty training session just fuel. so you can eat ice cream. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what you want to have is you want to have, when it comes to those, is some type of balance, right? If you're doing a keto diet, you want to have some type of refeed day. Mm -hmm. If you're doing an infant pitcher macros, you want to have some type of normalcy throughout the day when it comes to your macros, right? You can't just have one meal that has... 200 grams of carbs, you know, because you saved them up all day. It's not how it works. It's not rollover minutes, <laughs> right. you know? 
So as long as people don't take advantage of the diets and they do them, you know, with proper insight, they can be successful. But I feel like once you start neglecting food groups and stuff like uh, that keto diet does, I feel like it's not sustainable. And then I also feel like it's not the best for performance, right? Because with the keto diet, you need to be in ketosis for it to work. But if you train too high at a high intensity, then you get out of ketosis. If you eat too much protein that day, then you're out of ketosis. So it has all these rules to it for it to actually be beneficial for you to start burning ketones instead of your body using carbs for its energy source, right? Is it the healthier version? Yeah, probably it's a lot healthier. But when you're trying to perform at the highest level, you're not really that concerned with health. Right. <laughs> right. You know? Screw there, your blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> there comes a point in time where if you're trying to be the best, it's not the healthiest route to begin with anyways. Right. Right, the healthiest route is to do everything in moderation. It's to exercise two to three times a week, do cardio at a moderate pace two to three times a week. That's quote unquote the healthiest way to live. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're training to be the best power lifter, to be the best Highlands game athlete, you're training five to six days a week, two to three hours a day, busting your ass in the gym. Yeah. That in and of itself is not healthy. But if your goal is to be the best, you know. You're going to probably take a few years off your life getting that way. Sure. So you got to set yourself up to achieve that, you know, and then have a game plan to get out of it, right? You can only diet for so long, like we were just talking about. You can only be in a calorie deficit for so long. So you want to go with a route that fits you and fits your, you know, your body type and your goals, right? If you're an endomorph, which is a naturally fatter person, and you want to diet to get abs, you can kiss probably all your strength goodbye. Sure. Because if you never had abs before, you're going to have to suffer a lot to get them. So you're not going to have any strength left over. So you want to make sure that your goals and your diet become one, you know, and they match each other. And you want to make sure that you can only, you set it up, you know, think of it like this in, in weightlifting terms, powerlifting terms, right? You can only peak with high intensity for so long before you have to decrease the weight and increase the volume sure because your joints get beat up same thing with diet like you can only diet for so long before your body starts to fight against you and before you start to lose strength and before it's not you know an improvement anymore so you want to kind of see where that's at and what i found to be effective is you know you diet for eight to twelve weeks in a calorie deficit Try to get off as much fat as you can, and then you go back into a slow, steady calorie surplus for the next four to six months. And then you diet again, eight to 12 weeks, just rinse, repeat, yeah. you know, and so, have, have that meet your training goals, you know. So obviously, if you're getting ready for a meet, you don't want to be dieting. If you want to diet, diet right after the meet when your training intensity is lower and your volume is higher. Yeah. So one of the things um, you were going to touch on it um, is an exit strategy. So when I hit 220, I hit it for a couple different competitions. I finally broke the record. Um, and so I was able to exhale, right? I don't have to stay at 220 anymore. Right. I can do whatever I want. Um, I got a couple of kids. So come home, there's cinnamon rolls. I'm like, oh, I mean, I can have like at least seven of these, right? Right. Um, I don't have, like I have a sweet tooth, but I only have it when it's around. And then obviously having kids, it's always around. So, um, what I've found, especially when I'm cutting for different competitions, having that exit strategy is almost more important than the actual diet itself. Yeah. Because setting that like allowance saying, okay, so this is the amount of time I'm going to relax from this, or these are the amount of meals I'm going to relax for this time frame is all that it's going to be. Right. Versus saying, fuck it, I'll yeah. do whatever I want. Yeah. Because um, no, that got exactly me in trouble. Right. Yeah. That got me in serious trouble, you know? Yeah. Next thing I know, I'm like three weight classes up. And right. Like, what am I going to yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you screw then because then you got to go back into it, you know? Like, if you have that game plan, then it's kind of like damage control after the meet, right? Yeah. Give yourself free time. I usually say after the meet, you go 90% clean foods, 10% bad foods. You know, that could be, okay, we have breakfast with the kids one, one morning, we go get some donuts. Mm -hmm. And then, say you do that Monday morning, and Friday night, you and the wife go out to eat, and you eat there. If those two to three meals are going to make you fat, then you're probably not training hard enough, you're probably sure. not doing everything else right. So you definitely want to 
relax, but you don't want to relax to the point where you completely derail yourself from what you tr are truly trying to achieve. So I usually tell my clients like four weeks before the diet ends or before their meet, okay, you know, two weeks out, I'm going to have your game plan for what you want to do after the meet, you know, go ahead, celebrate your win. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, try to get back on track. Wednesday, you know, here's a cheat meal. And then you just keep pushing on like that, you know, and then you, you also don't want to, if it's an extended diet, you definitely don't want to neglect giving them cheat meals, right? Because if you diet someone for 20 weeks without like no cheat meals or anything like that, what's going to happen as soon as they get off the diet? Just go right back at it. Yeah, they have a fucking pantry full <laughs> of stuff they've collected over the 20 weeks, right? Yeah. So if, like we just said, if you get fat off of one meal a week for a cheat meal, then you're not do, you're doing, you're doing, yeah, there's something yeah. going on, right? You're either somehow you have a stomach where you can just eat 20,000 calories in one meal or you're not having a cheat meal. It's a cheat day. Right. You You've know? been watching too many reruns of like the golden girls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So one meal is never going to make you fat. It's the, it's the combination of what you do from a day to day, week to week perspective. That's going to set you up for your goals, you know? So if you always keep that in mind, then you should be fine. So here's another thing. You've kind of talked on it a few times, talking about goals. Um, we're specifically talking about nutrition. Here's one of the things that I've found uh, to be helpful, and I talk to a lot of the clients I work with about, is um, writing down your goals, but then sharing them with other people. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a stranger, you know, like maybe sharing them with you or your significant other or uh, maybe your training partners. Um, what I found, the reason that, that works is if I say, hey, so I'm going to cut down to 220, and afterwards I'm going to have this two-week period where I'm going to have two cheat meals a week, like, they're going to be able to keep, like, an eye on that. Right. Like, they're going to be able to hold you a little bit more accountable, and you're going to feel held accountable when you call them up and say, hey, let's, I'm getting pizza, or I'm going out drinking, and yeah. it's like, man, this is the fourth time you called me this week. Right, right. You know, they know something's up. Um, so having those goals and, and allowing other people to know about them uh, help hold you a little bit more accountable. Yeah, no, I agree. That's the same reason why people hire nutritionists and hire coaches, right? It's that sense of accountability. Yeah. You know, especially when you hire a coach, you don't want to let the coach down. You don't want to let yourself down. Right. Right. So you're spending money on something that's going to hold you accountable because you got to check in with them. Yeah. You know, that's why with my clients, like we have two check ins a week. So that way they know, like, oh, shit, my check-in's coming up. I better not eat that. Got to lock it up. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So definitely being able to have people in your life that are goal-driven themselves that can hold you accountable is huge, right? If you have people in your life and you're surrounded by a bunch of overweight people, you're going to be overweight yourself, right? Yeah. So you have to align yourself with the people that share your goals and that share, you know, your passion for stuff. And then those people will hold you accountable. Those people will make sure that you're on the right direction, for sure. That's extremely important. Yeah. So what is your thought on um, using uh, performance nutrition and weighing yourself in, like, on a daily basis, weekly basis, or monthly basis? Um, daily daily weigh-ins are that'll, – that'll become a neurotic mess. Yeah. Like, you'll drive yourself crazy because – Weight day to day weight fluctuations happen. You know, you could have had a shitty night's sleep. You could have not yeah. drank enough water. Talking about the variables, again. right? That could be three to four pounds a day. Um, if you're doing, say, for me, I have my clients check in twice a week. Like I said, for accountability purpose, right? If they have a weigh in on Monday and they have one on Thursday, they're less likely to eat shit because they know they got to check in with you. But if yeah. you're doing it on your own, once a week is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once a week is going to allow you to check your progress to see if you're losing, you know, a half to one and a half pounds per week. Yeah. Right? If you're a bigger individual, you can lose two to three pounds per week, right? So you just ride that out until you hit a plateau, you know, and then you adjust your calories. But yeah, once a week is, is perfectly fine. You don't want you don't want food, you don't want weight to ever become an issue to where it's affecting your quality of life, right? Yeah. You know, you don't want to be an emotional eater. You don't want to be an emotional weighing in person, yeah. you know, because if you say you weigh in and the diet's not working, right, say you weigh in because the scale doesn't always tell the truth, but say you weigh in and you haven't lost weight in two weeks, you're probably just like, well, fuck it. Fuck it, it ain't working. Yeah, I'm not doing the diet anymore. Let me go eat this pizza. It, and 
then it's also a catch-22 because then if you lost 10 pounds, you're like, oh, wow, that was awesome. I'm going to go, like you said, go get some ice cream or, right. you know, I'm going to go eat some donuts. And yep. then that progress is gone. Yep. So you don't want to put too much of an emphasis on it. It's just, you know, it's like a, it's like a map, right? If you're trying to get from point A to point B, you got to have these checkpoints to know where you're at. So that's all it is, is just checkpoints, you know. You don't celebrate until after it's over. Yeah. You don't you don't play in the NFL and celebrate every single win like it's the Super Bowl you just won, right? They say if you know you make it to the end zone, pretend like you've been there before. You get on a scale, you lose some weight, like, okay, that's expected. Pretend yeah. like it pretend like it's no big deal. You get on the scale, you don't lose weight. Okay, let's make a small adjustment. Don't freak out, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. The only way that I know if I'm like two twenty or not, if I don't step on a scale, is I can see my feet. Yeah. Like I look down. I'm like, oh yeah. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to weigh in. Everybody has their indicators. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you can see your feet, that means you're good. Yeah. You know, you don't even need a scale. You just go by, <laughs> like the shadows of your feet, right? If you right. can see one lace, you're probably at two thirty. You can start seeing a few more laces. You know, you're you're yeah, getting there. Get close. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So there's an interesting show. Um, that just came out called, uh, and I might be wrong, I'm whatever, but it's like Fit to Fat to Fit. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen that yet? Yeah, it shows great. I thought that was pretty interesting. Is that something you'd ever do? Would you ever get, like, well, you're fat now, but, like, would you get fatter? Right. I don't know if I could get to the fit part. That would be the problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think maybe they'll bring me on the show so the trainer can lose weight with me. I think that would be, that would be good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely... If I if say I was just focused on personal training and not focused on sure um, your own goals yeah then yeah that that's great it's it's a great way to put yourself in your client's shoes right if you've never been there before yeah a lot of those clients or a lot of those trainers on that show have never been fat before so how can you how can you sympathize with them you know right. how can you say don't cheat on your food because I've never cheated on mine or right. why These why don't you have any, right why don't you have any energy. Right, it's great when the trainers go through the same workout as the people they're with after they've gained the weight, <laughs> and they get their ass kicked. Yeah, yeah. it's great because it, it allows them to, you know, be able to. The client one sees that okay, this person's struggling, but he's still pushing himself, and the trainer's like, okay, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. You know, when you're seventy pounds bigger. Yeah. You know, the one guy I saw, he uh, he actually almost. He almost killed himself getting up in weight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I went to the doctor and the blood pressure was out of it. Yeah, I think it was like 160. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's a great show because it's as that because it's over like an eight month span. Yep. Right? So and they're doing it at their house. Like they're it's not like the biggest loser where they're taking them to a controlled environment where they are like forced caffeine to stay up on night. Okay. They're exercising like right. eight hours a day. What happens when you get to the real world, you know? Yeah. And they all gain their weight back. So at least this one is a little bit more um, realistic, right? Because a lot of the trainers are in the same city as the clients they're working with. So not only can the client like always go back to them, you know, but the client is doing it as they go to work, as they're living their life. Yeah. So I think that's an awesome Everything's show. back to normal. Yeah. You know, the one thing that really sticks to me is letting somebody know uh, that has like a weight problem that they're human. Because they're seeing some of the changes that are happening to this trainer. Um, and sometimes I think when you're super fat, you look at somebody who's in really good shape and you're like, man, you're almost like not human because yeah. you work out three, four hours a day. You're eating carrots and broccoli and it seems fine to you. Yeah. Um, where a fat person's like, oh, give me chips and cookies and you know, right. watch TV. Yeah. And it's really good to see that the trainers fail um, and they have those struggles so that People that are overweight can see that it's they're human. That once you get on track, it's easy to stay there. Yep. You just got to get going. And um, I thought that was a really interesting show. Yeah, I think it's a great show for sure. I'm working on just trying to get fat. I'm. I just want to know what it's like. And yeah. So I'm gonna get to that spot, try it out for a little bit, and then cut back down. And I'll probably go on the show to to do be a mentor. Or, yeah. Yeah, like a life coach. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just I feel that's my calling. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've been ripped since I've known you, so yep. good luck getting fat. With yeah, that I mean, it's going to be tough, but yeah. you know, I'll try it. <laughs> I was uh, I was experimenting with some uh, Instagram ab shots, um, yeah. and so just to really show like the 36-pack that I have, I set my stomach up against the cyclone fence, 
and I was on the other side snapping pictures like this, using some filters and stuff. And it looks, yeah. I mean, it looks like I'm ripped as shit. Yeah, it's yeah. a good, good ad maybe. Yeah. To start our own supplement company. Supplement company, like online training. Um, you know, if you want to look like this, yeah, just give me two thousand bucks a month. Yeah, a month. Yeah, and uh, that's the initiation fee. Yeah. And you're on your way. Yeah. Just make sure that you let them know that they can eat pizza and other yeah. stuff while they're doing it and get shredded. Yeah. And they got to send like regular pic, like nude pics regularly. Yeah. 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 That's man. uh, good luck with that, man. I'm an entrepreneur. You're a trendsetter. You're a trailblazer. <laughs> That's yes, for sure. That is for sure. But I think, uh, I think you've definitely shed some light on some of the performance nutrition. I think, um, it's really important, uh, you know, for my feeling before was always kind of how you said, you know, you got to be fat to move a huge amount of weight. And that's, I never cared about nutrition um, until probably about five years ago. And then it was kind of more of, I, I feel like I could be way more lean and lift more weight. Um, and I was able to do that. And I think a lot of people need to hear that more often that, you know, it's okay to have those cheat meals. You're going to have them, whatever. Uh, but there's a time and a place to start implementing diets. It's not year-round. It's not um, just specifically for competitions. But there's a time and a place to do it to make it so that you're going to be the most successful as an athlete. Yeah, definitely. I think if, you're, if your main intention is to be the best you can at a sport, it's always important to have some type of game plan and never just kind of wing it, you know? Whether it be allowing yourself X amount of cheat meals, whatever it is, have some type of game plan so that you're always keeping yourself accountable for what you for what you do. Because obviously, the better you eat, the better you're gonna perform. And if performance is your main goal, then don't sell yourself short by eating crap all the time. Yeah. What's uh What's your go to cheat meal? Go to cheat meal. Um, pizza, pizza, and ice cream. Really, it's an easy one. Yeah. 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 Oreos are good. You know, I like to, I actually, what me and my, uh, my girlfriend do now because, uh, cause she's allowed one cheat meal a week for her, uh, her nutritionist allows her that we, uh, we pick a restaurant we go to. So it's kind of like whatever we're in the mood for that, that day. I'd much rather go out to eat. Right. That so way much I easier. To see the shit after right. I'm done, you know? <laughs> You gotta clean the grease out of the pan afterwards. Yeah, yeah, because after you eat a big meal, you're you're sweating a little bit and you're just ready to go to sleep, right? So if you have to clean stuff up and get everything ready, then it's just yeah. it just defeats the purpose. No, I understand. Heart rate's going. Yeah, yeah. The meat sweats. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. No. You know my uh, my my total issue is uh, cookies. Yeah. Yeah, cookies. I don't care what kind of cookie it is. Doesn't matter. Uh, there's cookies in front of me. I'm in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good thing you have the kids to take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. As, if you ever go look in our pantry, uh, there's never cookies in there. Yeah. Because either one, I've already eaten them, or Courtney hasn't bought them because she knows I'm gonna eat them. Yeah. That's those. Are the, those are the only two options. She's a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she used to make uh, pies on my cheat days, and she never understood. Whole days, huh? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. I had a whole day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Every Sunday was <laughs> eat whatever you want all day long. So she'd make pies at nighttime, and I would eat the pies in the middle. And she she couldn't figure it out the first one or two pies, uh, but it was because I ate the whole thing. So yeah. it didn't matter where I started. Right. You know, there, you don't cut it up. You just start eating it until it's start gone. Start from the middle. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It was disgusting. There you go. It's a pro tip, guys. Start pro from tip. the middle and eat your pies. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, you want to tell people where they can find you? Yeah, you can find uh, me at tmnutrition.net and then on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at uh, Tony Montgomery Jr. And uh, that's pretty much, and Twitter too, yeah. So Tony Montgomery Jr. for pretty much everything and then tmnutrition.net for articles, free content, and stuff like that. I feel like uh, the Mount Me part has got to be somewhere in there. I don't really know where you that came from. I don't know I don't know how that oh, came Oh, no, I brought out. it. I came up with it. Yeah. I think it's a good, like... Action name? I don't know what kind of action star I'm going for here, though. <laughs> we might need to come up with a different name then. Yeah, yeah. Mount Me is not really the best thing that I've ever meat I've sweats. Ever called. Meat sweats. Yeah, Tony meat sweats. <laughs> all these have a very gay innuendo to them. Right. All right. All right. We got to work on something. I'm very, cool. very manly. All right. Like, I have a beard and a Harley. Like I can't just have gay innuendos to my nickname. Okay. I'm gonna come up with. 
a more manly. Yeah, because I can't nickname myself. That's kind of douchey. Sure, sure. So yeah, yeah. That'll sure, be your task. That came out with Larson for us. Does that make me douchey? That your nickname is your last name? Well, no, kind I... of. <laughs> Shit. We we need to restructure all this. Yeah. <laughs> There's some flaws in here. Yeah. You're thinking here. My marketing isn't the best. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, under Larson Press or Adrian Larson. Uh, make sure to go to my YouTube page, like and subscribe it, and uh, find me at LarsonPress.com. Thanks for listening. See you guys. <laughs>